one of the things I, I just see the, the biggest problem around is the entry level, more junior level folks that they come in and, and they're, they're being held back and, and, and not uh, trained and, and there's no opportunity for, for growth and you can't blame them from leaving. You're going to have those people leave. And I encourage anyone I talk to, if you're okay, if you've been at your company X amount of years, you're no longer entry level. So if your company's not going to pay you the way you should, then you do need to move somewhere else. I mean, it's sad. It has to be that way. I, one of uh, my former uh, colleagues, at the college where I taught at was part owner of a consulting company. He was always complaining to students about job hopping, but it's like, if you can't blame them, if you, you got to make more money, why would you want to stay? What is the reason to stay somewhere? You know, the loyalty usually doesn't go both ways. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the 401 Access Deny podcast. I am your co-host for the episode today, Joseph Carson, Chief Security Scientist and Advisory CISO at Delinea. And I'm joined with my co-host, Chloe. Uh, Chloe, you want to tell us what you do and, uh, and a little yeah. bit about yourself? Hi there. I'm the Chief Impact Officer over at Cybury. Awesome. And we're joined by a fantastic uh, special guest today, which is Phil Wiley. So Phil Wiley, welcome to the podcast. Uh, if you tell us a bit about yourself, what you do, and, and some of the things you, you enjoy doing, uh, it doesn't have to be cybersecurity related. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for, for inviting me to be a guest today. It's an honor to be, to be with you guys and actually my second Cyberary podcast. But uh, I'm Phil Wiley, I'm the hacker in residence at SciCognito. So basically, I'm the internal pen tester for the company as well as an evangelist. So I speak at different conferences and teach workshops on topics around defensive security. Uh, I'm a former adjunct instructor from Dallas College. I taught pen testing and web app pen testing there for almost four years. Uh, I do a lot of mentoring and helping people get started in the industry. Fantastic. And you also do have an awesome book as well. You want to tell us uh, a bit about Thank the you. book as well. Yes, I have a book called The Pentester Blueprint, and it was actually uh, last month, actually made the two-year anniversary. Uh, it was based on a lecture that I did for my pen testing class when I started teaching back in January of 2018. The very first lecture I gave was on what it takes to become a pen tester. By November of 2018, I turned it into a conference talk and gave it at our, at our local B-Sides conference, gave it several times after that, and then I was in the Tribe of Hackers Red Team book, mm -hmm. uh, published by Wiley Publishing, and they reached out to me and asked me if I was interested in writing a book. And I had the intent or desire to write a book based on the Pentester Blueprint uh, book. Mm -hmm. And so basically, the book is not only it, it tells you about the Pentester role and what it takes to become a Pentester, your prerequisites, different certifications, and education and education resources around that. There are a lot of great books on the skill of pen testing, but no one was really showing what the prerequisites were. And actually it was really one of the first books of its type in cybersecurity, telling people mm -hmm. what it took to get into cybersecurity outside of just teaching the actual concepts. Fantastic. And that's what this, this episode is all about. I mean, I, I kind of give it the title of like, you know, breaking bad versus breaking good. And one of the reasons for that is that you know, over the, the last couple of years, I've been interacting with a lot of, let's say, the you know, malicious side of the hackers, you know, those who have been doing malicious intent. And, and what's happened is we started seeing a lot of rehabilitation. We started seeing them looking to change their ways and start to, you know, use their skills for good. And that's one that's really important, you know, that most people like that need to understand that not all hackers are bad. The majority of us are, you know, out there with, with good intent to make sure that we're helping organizations, we're helping protect society, and we're making sure that, you know, as many vulnerabilities that we, we reduce those risks as much as possible. But one of the biggest things we're facing is that, you know, that really the skills and the people shortage, we're having a massive gap, um, you know, might be impacted by the great resignation where we're seeing, you know, the pandemic, a lot of people changing roles. Um, but one of my big problems is that I would really want to, to, to make sure that those who are starting off or those who are really explore, exploring their skills is to make sure that they have a path to using them for good. They have a path to a job and a career. Um, so one of the things is that, you know, is that the entry level, unfortunately, for crime is way much lower than it is to get into the industry. What things can we do in order to make that much a lower barrier? How can we make sure we attract more talent uh, in order to, to choose the good path versus the bad path? 
Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things I really like, and I was I used to be a bug crowd ambassador, and actually that's how how Chloe and I met. Uh, was through through Bug Crowd, and one of the things I liked about Bug Crowd was the fact that uh, that uh, you know people could get jobs doing pen testing type skills without uh, having to go through the normal normal way of going getting into the industry because some cases they expect you to have years of experience, and that's you know one of the things that makes it more difficult. So those options like uh, bug bounty programs, pen testing as a service like Cobalt and Synac offer are great ways for people to get in. But we need more opportunities like that. And you mentioned the thing about the crimes and stuff. I think that's one of the things that I think we need to forgive people for some of those crimes and realize people make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes and, and should be given a second chance because a lot of cases, if you're desperate for money, I don't care who you are. You'll do just about anything you have to, to feed your family or take care of yourself. And so I think we really need to learn that we can forgive people. And when people have the opportunity to make money, they're less likely to do those type of things. And usually it's because they have to, not really because, you know, there's some people that like crime and that's just, they enjoy those type of things. But in other cases, I think most people want to make an honest legal living. Absolutely. I... Uh, Chloe, any thoughts around, around oh. this from, from you? Yeah, it was so funny because right when Phil was jumping out, I was like raising hand. I was about to say, oh, yeah, that's how I met Phil uh, through Bug Bounty. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, the reality is, is that when I worked for a Bug Bounty company, it made me really realize of thousands upon thousands of people that deserve to have a role in cybersecurity, but they're told they can't because of their past experience or because they don't have a college degree or a cert. And not everyone in the world has the opportunity to do so. So of course they're going to find a way using their skill set to pay for things to have a living. A lot of the bug bounty hunters that I talked to that were previously criminals in their activity, what they were doing was that they had to make a living because no companies were going to hire them. So they started doing all these malicious things to get paid. And so then they could put food for their family I remember this one case, this guy, he was basically taking care of his parents and all his siblings, and he had to try making a living for them at the age of like 16 and just couldn't sleep during the night because because he was just worried that he was going to be taken from his home and then no one's going to be able to provide for the family and then they would end up in the street. And so him, when he found out that there is a legal way how to do this, then he went to bug bounty and started doing that until he could find a job. And it took him a couple of years to get a job because he didn't have a college background. So it's like, it's one of those things, like I also think about our US prison system. We always are like, oh, they're gonna repeat when they leave. In reality, the only reason they're repeating it, majority of the cases is because they can't get hired. And so it's like Phil mentioned, how do you yeah. change up, society yeah. to accept that? Absolutely. Many, many of the, the former, you know, uh, uh, criminal hackers, they, they end up being consultants and working for themselves because they just can't get jobs with, with the industry because the industry kind of holds that against them. Um, and I think it's, I think it's sad. You know, I, I remember, I, I, you know, cases I've seen in the UK, UK actually have a rehabilitation program to actually take, you know, juvenile cyber criminals, you know, uh, and, and take them and start, you know, looking at using their skills for good and, and start getting them integrated into the industry and helping them on a path where they can actually be helpful. And I think that's something we should look at from a global perspective. I think all, all countries around the world should be really looking at, you know, especially I think even, you know, when I started my career, there wasn't any good way to test your skills. Everything was done by the curiosity. We're doing it in live systems. Uh, but the great thing today is that you actually got a lot of great even platforms out there to do simulation and gamification to practice your skills. So the great thing is, is that we want to make sure we, we point them in that direction. If they're, if they're looking to test and, and learn and, and share and explore, we should make sure they have access to the platforms, which, which doesn't break the law, which allows them to really enhance their skills. So for me, I think there's multiple challenges that we have. Um, and, uh, you know, rehabilitation and making sure the opportunity for, for those who have, who have swayed in the criminal side in the past and make sure they actually have a way to contribute to society going forward. We should never, you know, exclude them forever. There should always be a path uh, to contribute. 
Yeah, I totally agree. One of the things that I think is is another barrier is the price of some of these certifications oh. and security training. I mean, you know, you look at some of the, when you look at the ones like offensive security, which is less experienced than like SANS, that's still, mm -hmm. you know, two or $3,000 to pay for the training to get through that. And so many companies are, you know, so dead set on, you know, needing a degree or mm -hmm. certification to get jobs. And some of the best pen testers and hackers I know in the world have zero certifications. You don't necessarily have yeah. to have them. Companies just had to find better ways of vetting their skills, skill set, and giving people a chance. Absolutely. I, 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 the certification, certification challenge we have in the industry needs to be changed. Uh, we need to, I would love a lot more opportunities for things like more, you know, for every one that uh, an organization buys, they get to give one away for free. Uh, you know, we should look at the certification industry to, to find entry levels way for people to get free education, free knowledge. And, and there, if they don't do it, there's going to be other other innovations and other new startups and other ways to find that. Uh, but we have to make sure that certifications is not the barrier. Um, and it should not be because absolutely, Phil, you know, for me, a lot of the people I know in the industry have zero certifications, didn't go to university, didn't go to college, um, but their knowledge is all self-taught. And that's what you really want. You want people who have the drive and passion to learn. And when they go and, and spend their own time, personal time, uh, in order to get the skills um, and enhance those and, 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 and really become you know, the best that they can in that area without certifications, I think that alone is something that we should value. Um, and we should, we should have a way to measure it. I think that's one of the things we're missing is a good way to, to measure that skill. Um, and make sure organizations have a way to 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 get the right people and not just go after those who can afford it. Oh, Joseph, so you're talking about yeah, like I the agree. hacker some of, mindset, some of the... basically? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, some processes I've seen that people use different companies' platforms to vet, and, mm -hmm. and you see some companies like Synac and mm -hmm. uh, even Cobalt, they have challenges set up for people to come in and try those challenges and they get access to the platform. Another company has something really creative too, a consulting company called Praetorian. And if you go to their website, I haven't looked in their site in a while, but you go to their website, if you're interested in careers, they have challenges on there. So they have these different hacking challenges. If you solve those, you submit it and you'll be considered for employment. So I think more companies need to do that. Have those little challenges on their, on their, uh, careers page and let people go out there and solve it. If they solve it, yeah, they apply. If they don't, then they know what they need to do next. Maybe even give people some guidance on, you know, what skills are required to pass that challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things as well is I get really frustrated. Uh, Chloe, what's, what's your thoughts on one of the, the challenges that I've seen as well is that not only with certifications, but also with job descriptions is the oh, crazy, God. I don't know who's creating the job descriptions or who's writing them. Um, but they are just, I, I think it, no one can get, find the skills in those job descriptions, um, even with years experience and, you know, tons of certifications, any thoughts around the, the challenge there with not just certifications, but also the job descriptions as well. I wish I had vodka in here and it was in the evening. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to be honest. The reality is, is that our job descriptions there's so many issues with it. The first thing I would go with is that years of experience, just get rid of it. You don't need to have that on there. Just state what are the skills you need to know beforehand? And then what are the, you know, desired skills? And why desired skills, I mean, mm -hmm. desired skills should be things like uh, that you know you're going to have to train them no matter what. Now, one of the things I always have a problem with when it comes to job descriptions is that it's usually written by someone who is trying to fill a position using the history of a previous person who sat in that seat. So the problem you're gonna get here <laughs> is that sometimes you'll get job descriptions that will legit say guy or man in the job description still to this day mm -hmm. because they're hoping to fill that position with another guy. And it's not a problem at all, but when you're someone who is you know, a person of color or a marginalized gender, you're mm -hmm. gonna have some problems applying for that job. And so I think what we can do is shorten it. I really like how Cyber SN does it. I don't know if you've been on their website, but basically they have this like template for all the companies when it comes to a certain job title 
of what the requirements are that you need to know and where things they're going to train you in. And I really like that approach. And I think that we could do a better job on job descriptions, but also note that when you hire people, don't expect them to be able to do everything when they first get in. It is your job as an employer to continue training. At most companies, it's three months of training. So you are investing in these people you're onboarding. Don't just bring them in and then like have your way. That's not how things work. And we have to do better on that front is to know we have to keep training people. Yep. It starts even at the onboarding process. Absolutely. Phil, any thoughts on that, that topic as well around job descriptions and also continuous training as well? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that because, I mean, the it's kind of ridiculous some of the, the job descriptions. And sometimes the people write them have no clue. It could be HR. Hmm. They really don't have any idea about the role. Uh, I was a red team lead at a global consumer products company a few years back. And one of the things I noticed, we were trying to hire another red teamer in India, but the job description was so vague. It really didn't. Cause you know, for red, for actual true red teaming, you need mm -hmm. a network pen testing background, web app pen testers, you know, you could teach them to be red teamers, but it's going to take a little bit more. You really have to be heavier mm -hmm. on the infrastructure side as well as social engineering, that type of thing. I went and looked at the job description. There were no mentions of active directory, nothing about uh, network pen testing. We were getting a bunch of bug bounty uh, resumes or web app pen testers. And this was, this was a senior role too. So it wasn't like you mm -hmm. could bring in someone and train them from this lower level. It was a senior level mm -hmm. role, but just, and I see that with a lot of these descriptions that the descriptions aren't created properly, you know, the details of the job and stuff. Sometimes it's just something they I've seen uh, job descriptions where companies co so blatantly copied it from some other company. They forgot <laughs> to change the name <laughs> in the job description, but yeah, they, they, it's this laundry list of stuff they want. It's kind of ridiculous. They're looking for these unicorns. Yeah. I mean, it, this has been going on for years because back in my IT days, I was a sysadmin and I was looking at, at different job descriptions out there. This one company wanted someone that was like a Cisco expert plus a database administrator. You're not going to do, you're not going to be a database administrator and be doing this Cisco. You're going to specialize mm -hmm. in one or the other. But yeah, we've got to do a better job of doing that. And I like the, what Chloe was mentioning about uh, Cyber SN or the, whatever the company's yeah. name, the descriptions and what you'll learn there. I think that's good because if companies see what you can learn there, you're going to draw more candidates because people want to go somewhere where they can learn and they can grow. Uh, you know, one of the biggest reasons people leave is they get bored and they're not learning. They'll go somewhere else. It's not always Absolutely. about the money. But at the same time, too, I think, uh, you know, we should make sure we're paying fairly uh, because one of the things that's uh, a big pet peeve of mine, having a lot of former students and even seeing mm -hmm. uh, family members go through this where they go to work for a company and they start out at that entry level $60,000 a year uh, wage, mm -hmm. but then they outperform their coworkers and it's a company that's basically they pay on tenure. So once you've been here three years, then you can get promoted, but you can't get promoted to them. But yet this person is doing triple the work that everyone else is doing. So just the way they gauge and reward people is just kind of ridiculous. Yeah. And another thing to, yeah. to mention, to add to, add to Chloe's comment about, you know, the mentioned guy or something. If, if you see yeah. that in the job description, avoid that company at all costs. If you're a female yeah. or someone that doesn't fit that description, that role, stay away from them because, uh, yeah. yeah, it's not going to be. It's Even not going to get better men. if you do get the job. Even as men, <laughs> yeah. don't do it so, either. Yeah, be an ally. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, no, we should be. Yeah, I, really I even like remember how, Chloe. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say the one thing that I really like is so. when they do job descriptions and then they put the expected salary because I always feel like they always say, "Oh, the reason you're not getting paid more." Like for Phil, what you mentioned about like there will be a someone who will do so many things but doesn't get promoted because they're so good at doing all those things. And then their salary doesn't increase. And that's the thing that always bothers me because they throw it on the, the personnel saying, oh, it's your fault. You didn't negotiate better when you started. And I just feel like that's unfair. I think we should state what the salary is. Then there's no surprises. Absolutely. Do you think Joseph, one, you were gonna one say, of, yeah, totally. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. One of the things I've seen as well is that 
when companies, you know, we used to have that challenge because it used to be very location specific as well. Um, so you would work in a city and maybe, maybe there wasn't a lot of jobs in that city and this was what you'd be able to get. And over the last couple of years, of course, we've had the, you know, the acceleration of remote working and people being able to work from different locations and different around the globe. And we've seen that great resignation where people who may have been stuck in those jobs now have been able to get opportunities uh, across the world. Um, I'd just like to get your thoughts around that is that are we starting to see, you know, one is the, re- the retention period of those employees because you're going to find better paying jobs very quickly, even with just a few years experience. Um, are we starting to see, you know, companies struggle with retention because of this? Uh, because, you know, uh, companies, you know, offering bigger salaries for, you know, uh, people that's basically just kind of getting that first few years and performing really well. Just thoughts around that as well. I feel like I'm being Hermione Granger right, right now in Harry Potter. Please pick me. Um, <laughs> yes, go ahead. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> oh, geez. The, I think the great resignation was showing like, you're going to force people to come back in the office. That ain't happening. And then now they're like, we need you to, okay, okay. You don't have to come in the office only like a few days a week. Also, um, I'm going to hand over Paul's work over to you on top of things because Paul is leaving and then you're like, great. And then someone else comes and I'm going to hand you Sarah's work as well. Sarah is leaving. The reality is that we have that. It's not really called quite quitting. The reality is that people will Mm -hmm. leave if you do not invest in them. If you have poor leadership, they will leave. If you don't believe in them, they will leave. If they don't see a future there, they will leave. If they want to do things outside their work and you don't let them, they're going to leave. If they are a blue teamer but wants to learn the red and you're not allowing them to take that SANS training course or anything like that, they're going to leave. If you don't listen to your people, they will leave. That's where we are right now. We have a huge retention problem. This is the worst I've ever seen it. I don't know a single person in cybersecurity who isn't open to looking elsewhere. And that's letting you know we have a problem when it comes to leadership. It also means that we have a problem when it comes to over demanding things as well on security people, but also we're not investing in them. And so they're leaving in herds. And then not just that, but then we also have layoffs happening across in tech companies. Like today, there was a big announcement of a large tech company having a massive layoff of its workers. Mm -hmm. But the good news is like the security team was still safe. So the good news is that when it comes to layoffs, security teams tend to be more safe than other departments. But they also seem to be the one department that could use some help and assistance and some respect too. Absolutely. And that's my And it's also Phil in that as well. <laughs> Mic <Awesome>. drop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things I, I just see the, the biggest problem around is the entry level, more junior level folks mm-hmm. that they come in and, and they're, they're being held back and, and, and not uh, trained and, and there's no opportunity mm-hmm. for, for growth and you can't blame them from leaving. You're going to have, those people leave and I encourage anyone I talk to, if you're okay, if you've been at your company X amount of years, you're no longer entry level. So if your company's not going to pay you mm-hmm. the way you should, then you do need to move somewhere else. I mean, it's sad. It has to be that way. I, one of uh, my former uh, colleagues at the college where I taught at was part owner of a consulting company. He was always complaining to students about job hopping, but it's like, if you mm-hmm. can't blame them, if you, you got to make more money, why would you want to stay? what is the reason to stay somewhere? You know, the loyalty usually doesn't go both ways. Mm-hmm. You know, if the company is loyal to you, then if you feel loyal to them, I can understand, but you just can't be held back. And I think too many companies are making the mistake of that. And you're just, it, you know, be quite blunt. They're getting what they deserve. If people leave, if you're not taking care of your employees, when you see the money that uh, these companies are spending for, CEOs and all this and Mm -hmm. things they're spending on buildings and stuff. I worked for a mortgage company back in the, back in the late eighties, I mean, late, late Mm nineties up to 2012. And we were moving into a new building and just kind of one of the things where priorities get put sometime. And this is not even just around people, but just showing what they prioritized as far as where the budget went, we were moving into a new Mm -hmm. building gigabit networks were out. When we moved to this new building, we kept our hundred megabit, network but yet we had this huge remington statue in the hallway where you come into the building you have these leather chairs in the boardroom (laughs) and all this stuff that's really not there's no roi on it 
It's no that no justification. <laughs> but not we're not going to business. <laughs> we're not going to put the money where you could process loans faster. You know, a faster infrastructure. So, you know, that's a lot of cases with the people sometimes too. They're there's such a, a an imbalance in what people are getting paid. And I wish I could think of the name of the company, but there's this one company that where the CEO actually took a pay cut or a bonus cut to raise everyone in the company up to at least $77,000 a year. Yes. And what they noticed in that right. guy's awesome. I love following his Twitter and he came up the, the employees actually all pulled in together and bought him a, a, a Tesla because yeah, of that, I you know, and, you know, when you're, you got respect for your employees, the respect is going to be returned. The loyalty is going to be returned. They're going to work harder. Absolutely. And that brings up, I think one of the, one of the things I find in our industry is, you know, is that if you don't do continuous learning, you'll fall behind. That's definitely one of the things that, you know, I've been doing this for so long now, it's, you know, over 25 years. And when I started my career is completely different to where I am today, uh, from the technology I'm using, from what I do day to day. Um, and so if you stop, stop and stand still, you know, that's one of the things organizations need to understand in this industry is that you need to invest a lot into training, continuous training for employees to make sure one is that they feel valued, that they want to stay because that's what they actually need. That's, that's a part of the passion. That's part of the value um, in addition to salary is continuing investing in the, in the employees. I even find that, you know, if you look at, if you look at the average employee in our industry and you try to kind of guess their training budgets, apply to that employee, it is so tiny. It's so such a small part of their, their, their actually the organization's investment in people. I should be, I'm thinking that organizations need to be thinking that this needs to be 30, 40% off the employee's actually uh, value that they're getting salary should be invested back in because that will help you definitely grow and help you actually be, you know, uh, make sure the employee is actually going to be retained because I think that's one of the things that we're missing is to make sure that we, we don't forget that this is not a job that stands still. This is a job that is continuously evolving. The threats change. We need to continually, as you do digital transformation, as we do cloud, we do uh, cloud workloads, and different platforms, different technologies get introduced. We need to make sure we stay up to date with that. In organizations who don't invest in employees, over time, your organizations, are because the risk is going to keep increasing uh, if you're not investing correctly. Uh, so I'd like to get you know thoughts, Chloe, on your your you know thoughts around. Oh, you know, yeah. the lack of investment that companies do in employees when, when, when they're on board. Yeah, exactly. I will do so. But I just want to quickly, I just looked up, it's Gravity Payments as the company and his name was Dan Price, the person who did all his CEO cuts so then everyone could have make at least a minimum 70K. Awesome person to follow. That's pretty, pretty impressive guy. Absolutely. Yeah. He sticks to his values, you know, which we need to see in leadership. That's how you build trust is when leaders show their value by doing the things that they talk about. They take actions on it. But and that brings me to my first point. So I'm going to tell you about a case. And this is a very common case. Um, I'm not going to mention the company or anything like that. So there's this company where a good number of their individuals on their security team use uh, Cyberry for themselves outside of work because their boss didn't want to give it to them. So the boss basically said, or has this case that if I train them, they will leave. After talking to their, his colleagues that are on, you know, using Cyberry for themselves, they're all planning to leave. That's why they're on the platform because he's not investing in their future. So that just shows you how, how often is this Chloe? Oh my God. I would like to tell you it's every single day. There's not a, every time I go to a conference, I bring up a conversation with certain C CISOs about like, Hey, what about training your team? There was like, Oh, I, they're going to leave if I invested them. And then I'm like, okay, so what are you doing for your risk audits? Uh, what about cybersecurity insurance? Because if you have a breach, they're not going to cover you if you're not you know, making sure that your team is up to date on your training. And that's like one of the things that it's, I remember right when I joined Cyberry and I went to RSA conference and how I, for the first time in my life, I started hearing that myth and it drove me up the wall. Cause you know, even in DEI, the whole practice is if you want to keep people continue their education and 
we have so many leaders that are afraid to provide because they're like, they're going to leave if I do, which then is disheartening to think of because there's not a single piece of evidence out there that that is actually a true thing. If anything, if you invest in their future and their education, they're going to stay. Absolutely. And you know, people, people will always stay around people who, who value them. Um, and invest in them. That's 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 kind of that's where you get loyalty from. Is is when you when you find that people's investing back in you and spending the time, um, you want to stay. You want to keep doing that. Um, Phil, any any thoughts from you around this area as well as you know from you know the, the training and 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 imbalance that we have and you know how do we make sure we we keep employees uh, investing in them? Sure. And one of the comments I'd like to make to start out is the fact that uh, if you're not training. These employees, they don't have these needed capabilities down the road. I had a friend that mm-hmm. worked for a company and they got into heavy into cloud. No one on the team had any training on cloud pen testing. They had all hands meeting and the CISO was kind of berating people for not advancing and learning. But whenever your <laughs> budget's constantly being canceled, you're not providing any guidance. We really, we need to do more than just I think you should give them some the employees freedom to pick what they want to, but also mm-hmm. kind of give them some guidance. Here, you've got this amount of budget. Take wherever you want. Here's this other budget. We're moving towards cloud. We're going to use Azure. So we mm-hmm. recommend you get some Azure security training, or Azure, Azure training, and kind of guide them. Because a lot of cases, some people need the mentoring and help, especially early in their mm-hmm. career, to kind of guide them on what to learn to help them grow. But, you know, whenever you don't train the employees, it's I forget who the quote come from. I think it was Steve Jobs or something where they said, what if you pay them? What if they leave? And he says, what if they don't? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you keep people that are not growing and getting better then you're going you're you're just falling behind. And that comes up to another great point as well, is that if you've got people that's been staying around for 10, 15 years and you're not investing them, you could find actually people who's coming in from, you know, who's got a one or two years experience. That has stayed up to date. That's not, you know, current with the latest technologies, um, and actually, you know, their value might be much greater today with somebody who has one or two years experience with cloud security um, or, or CASB or access controls than somebody who's been around for fifteen years who's just not invested in themselves um, or had the company invest in them either. So that's some of the things that we also have to look at as well. Is that uh, sometimes you know, getting somebody with only a few years experience might significantly add a lot of value to the business as well. And I think you want to encourage that culture of learning. If you, mm-hmm. if there's no training budget there, there's no encouragement to learn, then they're not going to learn. And, and a, a good example of what I saw that someone's doing this the right way is I was listening to to Rob Fuller's talk at Texas Cyber Summit recently. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about his, his red team. Every Friday towards like the end of the day, they get on uh, hack the box and they practice, you know, doing CTF challenges on there to, mm-hmm. to help hone their skills. So, I mean, this is a creative way outside of just taking a course, they're constantly practicing what and learning new skills and they're doing this Absolutely. during business hours. And that's, that's I mean, fantastic. That's I think the, that's what all companies yeah. should be doing. Yeah. I was just gonna say- Absolutely. Chloe, any, any thoughts do, as well? Yeah. Oh, yes. When it comes to education, you need to have a good strategy. Like what Phil mentioned, like, doing Fridays afternoons as your training hold, that's really good. Also tie in why they need to do it. So if you just like, okay, everyone, you're going to take this Mm -hmm. course. It's like, cool. What does that have to do with me and what I do? So it's Mm -hmm. like, you have to find something that engages people because no one wants to learn something that they don't want to learn. Like, especially if you're someone who's like, I need that dopamine hit to be able to learn something, right? If mm-hmm. we can't get that dopamine hit, we're not going to want to learn something. So make it out as if it's a mission for them to learn it, but why? You've got to tell them why and then set it up for success as like, here's some KPIs of getting it through, how this is going to mm-hmm. matter to our team, our security in the long run, and how this will go back to your job and tie it into your role. And always open the floor up and ask them, what do you think we need to learn as well? And I think what Phil mentioned, which is Absolutely. a few practical exercises like CTFs, those are great because you gamifying what you just learned. I, I, I love I that. That's really I, love, good. I love CTFs. I love CTFs. It's my, it's my thing. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in them. And, and Phil, to your point, one of the things I really like what you said as well as, you know, uh, doing that simulations, that's a great way for team building. And one of the things is that, you know, in this, this industry is very stressful. There's a lot of burnout. There's a lot of stress. You know, long hours, 
when 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 incidents happen, it's chaos. You know, it's it's basically you know working long long hours, long days, and and sometimes sleepless nights. And I think we really need to bring in you know a lot of fun and and you know team building. And I like those those types of things where you bring the team together and have them train together, especially if you've got you know even red teams and blue teams, and actually mixing that. Um, or you're simulating an instance and stuff, you know, and it makes it, you can, it can make it a lot more fun. Um, and at the same time, it actually gets you simulations uh, and gets the team practicing real, uh, real events. I really, you know, I think organizations should be doing a lot more of that style um, of activities. And I think something that's very cost effective is cross training true to mm-hmm. let people go shadow someone else for a week or two to see how their job is. Because, you know, if you're passionate about what you're doing, you're going to be you know, passionate to learn, motivated to to improve. And so maybe someone finds out what their mm-hmm. true, you know, true interest is. is. Uh, there was a guy that was on my team uh, a while back at this bank I worked for. He started, he was an IT and he was taking some SANS courses for digital forensics. Mm-hmm. And he decided one day, I think I'm going to take a pen testing course to help make me a better digital forensics person. And when he took that, he found out he liked pen testing a lot more and he totally switched careers. And now he's got like a ton of, not saying you have to have a ton of certifications to be a pen tester, but he's got a lot because he's invested that much time in his education. Absolutely. And that brings me to an important point as well, is that um, one of the things I love about the B-Sides events is when they do the pairing um, with you know experienced speakers with new speakers. Um, what I'd I'd love to see in our industry a lot more better organization of basically matchmaking of, of mentors and new entry people who's looking to get in the industry. Um, I haven't seen anything really official around it. I've seen bits and pieces of it. You know, I do mentoring of speakers for some of the B sides events. I've done a few other you know um, hackathons and so forth. Uh, but I really love to see a much more well organized establishment of those who. Uh, like myself and, and you, Phil and Chloe, that all of us having a way for us to get give more back into the community and mentor and have a way of matching and, and getting mentors in certain areas. Maybe somebody's looking to get into Capture the Flag or somebody's looking to get into pen testing or, or digital forensics um, uh, or you know education or whatever it might be, but finding a way to match them with those who, because even today, I have my own mentor that I've been you know going to in the industry for a long time. Um, but I would love the opportunity to mentor a lot more people. So any thoughts around, and I know, Phil, you've done quite a lot of mentoring as well with the students and uh, anything that we can do as an industry to make that much more, let's say, easier uh, for for those new um, people that whether they're, you know, starting their career or mid-career um, uh, looking to really, you know, accelerate and get guidance uh, as well. Yeah, I would encourage anyone to reach out to people, whether they're actively saying they're looking for people to mentor because Hmm. one of the things that like my mentoring style is I kind of like to mentor a lot of people and I'll spend more time up front and then just periodically we'll exchange text messages or emails or calls to kind of, you know, just to kind of discuss things, but just kind of help them get set up with here's some good materials to study. Here's Mm -hmm. some good things, some good conferences, different groups to join and kind of get them started, but definitely reach out. Some people aren't always, don't have enough bandwidth to mentor Mm -hmm. people, but most people have 15 minutes or an hour. And one of the things I would encourage is the way diversity is good for organizations is good for the industry. Diversity of mentors is good too. Not only Mm -hmm. gender, race, and all this belief and all this is just having a diverse number, having multiple mentors and not just Mm -hmm. really depending on one. I think it's, you know, that way you're getting the different opinions, the different uh, Mm -hmm. uh, resources and things that you may learn better from one than the other. But I would highly encourage you to reach out to anyone. And that's for me, I've got at least a little bit of time for anyone that wants, Mm -hmm. wants the time. And also want to encourage anyone out there that if you're not mentoring, you know, do some mentoring. That doesn't mean that you have to spend an hour a, a week each week, whatever, just whatever time you can do. I mean, uh, one of the things that like on Twitter, there's the cyber mentoring Monday that they do periodically that they send out the tweet on Monday and people looking for mentors will reply. Mm-hmm. So if someone's interested in mentoring, just kind of monitor that and see who needs help with some mentoring and, and, and help out. Cause I mean, it's a very rewarding experience. And, you know, if you haven't mentored, I highly recommend it, at least give it a, 
a try just from what you, the experience of helping others, mm -hmm. you know, like they say, it's better to give than receive. And you just get tenfold of what you're giving when you help others. Absolutely. Absolutely. Chloe, any, any, any thoughts around mentoring? Yeah. So my co-founder and I, for We Open Tech, we did a talk at Arts A conference that breaks down what does mentorship, how does it work, how are the best practices. So I really encourage people that if they want to go into mentoring um, they themselves to check it out. It's really important that we learn best practices because I'm one of those unfortunate people with other people that had a mentor at one point or a couple mentors at one point that were using it to boast themselves up in their career. So basically they use you and your image to increase their opportunities or they want to have a relationship or romantic relationship with you. So it's one of those issues that I have found and other people I know have gone through. And so I took a break from mentor, like getting mentored by anyone because I was so afraid that those things would happen again. So one thing I really mm -hmm. recommend is checking out a couple different organizations. So Cybersity has a mentorship program. Diana Initiative has a mentorship program. Uh, Cyberjitsu, Weiss's, these are great organizations to get involved. So then you can be matched with someone. Um, but also internally, you should all have a mentorship program because it could be really good for everyone at the end of the day. It's not just like, oh, we just need a mentor. Woman. No, it's for everyone to participate. If they want to learn something new from one of their colleagues or something that's across mm -hmm. their department, this gives them an opportunity to learn from you. And also, if you're reaching out to people for mentoring, please don't send a message saying like, hey, I would love for you to be my mentor. Tell me why I should invest in my time with you. Why are you coming to me in particular? What is it that you're looking to get out of it? So when you do send those emails and everything, make sure that you are being direct about what you're looking for and reach out to people and state why them in particular. That will help you out a lot. Oh, absolutely. Be very clear in what you're looking for. It uh, definitely makes it a lot more easier to make sure you're getting the right person uh, and the time is being valued. So absolutely. Um, I'd like to kind of cover some of the, the, you know, as people are, you know, coming down this path and, and they're going into their career. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I come from old school education, you know, really kind of the industrial side of education. That's my background. But I always kind of looking, I was always one for reading and learning and uh, learning from others and, uh, uh, you know, spending time trying to find new ways. Is there new ways, um, is there new kind of, you know, startups or new techniques or new methods that's really helping accelerate uh you know the path to, into the industry as well is there something that you know we're starting to see I, I, what i've really enjoyed you know uh, uh, philip mentioned earlier about the gamification platforms um the bug bounty platforms which are a great great way to you know and then there's different levels of entry in bug bounties as well you, know, you can go for some easy wins versus you know some of the more you know complex ones is there any new technologies or training methods that's really helping um, make sure that we can accelerate where we need to be. Because uh, I just feel that every year we're falling that slightly a bit behind <laughs> um, with getting the you know diversity, getting people from different backgrounds as well, people who are good at communicating, people who are good at psychology, who can talk to users uh, much better. Because uh, we, we, you know, cybersecurity in our industry, it's not just about technology. That's what we sometimes, you know, we have to remember. It's not just about the tech. It's about processes. It's about business. It's about uh, people. And we have to make sure that we go beyond that. So I'm just interested, both Phil and Chloe, just is there any new ways that we can, you know, start looking at that can help make sure we're accelerating and, and closing that gap in the future? Yeah, I think one of the one of the, the things, the platforms I really love is try hack me and hack the box since it's mm -hmm. kind of hands-on. And you know, when I'm when I talk about hack the box, their new hack the box academy, because yep. The method they use and try hack me is similar. You'll go through and read, you know, a few paragraphs of how to do a certain task, and then they give you the task to perform. So mm -hmm. I've seen some things that are kind of overwhelming. You're thrown in into a CTF type scenario, a vulnerable VM or something. <laughs> they give you directions on what you're supposed to do, but no guidance on how to do it. But with these platforms, they'll show you how to do this first thing and they build on each one of those tasks up until you're doing mm -hmm. a bigger task and you're actually performing a hands-on in a simulated environment. I think those are some of the best ways to do it. It makes it more interesting than just 
trying to mm -hmm. read a 300 to 400 page book because one of the things that when you mentioned kind of the older ways of education that I think kind of fails is, you know, your traditional universities typically don't get much hands on. It's mainly reading mm -hmm. and theory. Academic and, very much. Yes. Yeah. And I ran into a student a few years ago back when I was first starting to teach and he was asking me, why do my friends with two year degrees find jobs in technology or security easier than I do with a four year degree? And part of that is that mm -hmm. usually the two year degrees focus more on hands on. You don't have as much time, but they're using it's really lab heavy mm -hmm. and they're getting the hands on. So that's one of the things that they're kind of missing in the college level. And I think this is just really a good way to learn is to make sure you're emphasizing using hands on methods to actually learn, mm -hmm. learn the skills. The methodology is important, but we need to apply the methodology. Absolutely. Chloe, any thoughts around that as well? Yeah, I would say apprentices like programs are really good. Um, like Phil was mentioning, when we have people that kind of like we can shadow and learn straight from, that's going to be really great. I think like having a day in a life where you go around with someone for like a day or a week to get an idea of what that job entails and the mm. things you need to learn, I think is great. I think one of the things is that we are overwhelmed with all the things that we think we need to know before we get started or before we can become good at that area. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. Like you go on YouTube, you're going to watch videos that talks about, oh, this is the way of, you know, becoming a pen tester. When in reality, like Phil's book is probably the better one. And so it's, it's really depends on the person and their learning style. For me, I have to read it and experience it to know what to do. I can watch videos of people doing it, but I'm not actually really, it's just giving me an idea, but it's not training me on how to do those things. But being there physically with another person mm -hmm. is much easier for me. I have to experience it to know it. So that's why like labs are really important. Cyber, we have labs on all our, on our courses and that helps us from reading something or watching some video to be able to know what do I do next. So I think it all depends on learning, but the more interactive, the better. The more gamify you do it, the better. Absolutely. Any way that you can increase dopamine, Absolutely. everyone, is the way how you win the game. <laughs> Absolutely. The, the more you make it community based and, and gaming based, that's when you give people rewards back for the progress that they make. I think that really gets exciting. And for me, what I really, you know, so Phil, you mentioned about uh, try hack me. I really, for entry level people, try hack me is fantastic because it's just that step by step. It's just, you know, it takes you step by step through the process to train, you know, to train you in those specific, you know, either tracks or, 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 or certain areas. Um, to Chloe, to your point as well, is that you know, like the cyber platform platforms where you get the instructor uh, led approach, where you get the actually person training you and taking you through it as well. And then the hack the box, which I would say is, you know, the bit more advanced where it's the exploratory um, side of things. You, you, you're not given the exact steps, but you have to explore and not every solution is the same. <laughs> um, so there's very different uh, ways of kind of uh, going through. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, absolutely, it's getting a gamification, getting a challenge. Either you team up or you decide to go solo, um, but it gives you kind of progress. Um, it gives you simulation. And, and a lot of times they're very real world uh, scenarios. Some of the things I also really like today is also there's a whole new generation. You know, I come from the, the old times of blogging where you write a blog and post it. Um, um, or, we, you know, we, we're doing the podcast and we, we release it so people can listen to it uh, while they're commuting. Um, but I really love the, the kind of, the new age and generation of content creators were um, they're spending an hour a week um, and just sh sharing their skills. I even think like hacking esports is going to be taking off uh, where, you know, people would be paying just to watch people hacking and showing off their skills and learning from that as well. And they also, you know, become the mentors. So I think there's a couple of definitely new ways uh, that, uh, you know, that, you know, we've all kind of looked at it. Well, definitely, I think the more people that get involved in them, the more, the people are aware that they're available. Um, and I think also, you know, for those maybe that might be considering, you know, that are, are interested in this area and they're going on YouTube and they're watching videos and they're learning these skills and they might, you know, download Kali and, um, and they start, you know, playing around. I think, you know, the more they were aware that there's platforms that they can use, which is, you know, is not going to make them illegal activities versus going and testing it on legitimate companies. I think that's one of the things we have to make sure that people are aware of these before they start going down that path of, you know, illegal activities. Um, 
So I think that's one of the things we, you know, more awareness of these capabilities and, and uh, uh, platforms before people take the wrong path. Yeah, no, you're yeah, right. Yeah, one comment to make which on is the, you don't have the rights. hack the. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, just one comment. I wanted to comment on the Hack the Box. They actually, the Hack the Box Academy actually provides the step-by-step -step hmm. part of it now, part of the, the academy. Uh, yep. Yeah, no, yeah. They, they have the both the both options where you can get the guided step where you can actually yes. you know, go through. Um, a lot of the retired machines have the, the walkthroughs, but those active machines and the challenges uh you know you either team up with people or 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 you go <laughs> you go down the path for you know like i do sometimes some weekends where i'm looking at a challenge i'm just like i have no idea and you start <laughs> you'll have, you'll have to go off and learn um you know something i think it was the last time i was hitting my head against the table was uh i was uh it was a, a server-side template injection with flask I know nothing about flask uh, and and that for me was something you know i had to go and teach myself install it um, find out how the default configuration is and try to understand it from um, by actually installing and, and going through the process myself and then starting to see, okay, for, you, know, you know, it's like almost like I will say, it's like looking at a house from the outside and trying to determine how the room's configured. Um, and that's some of the things, you know, the exploratory side and starting that gets you into the mindset as well. I think those are some of the good ways of challenging and learning. So I'd like to get for for those who's listening in in the podcast, and you know, either they might be starting their career, um, you know, this is their their first kind of they they're interested, they're interested in learning, or they might have already kind of got you know the basis of skill sets. They've been watching tons of YouTube and Twitch, and they might have watched a lot of videos with a cyber mentor or Ipsec or John Hammond or whatever it might be on there. They've been kind of really interested. In, it's a path that they want to go on. Um, uh, or somebody who's, who's mid career and they're doing some, maybe they're a sysadmin or maybe they're in it or maybe even maybe an accountant or somebody who's just, um, uh, or somebody who's in, you know, psychology and other areas for those who's looking at this industry and considering getting into it, what, what kind of words or what, what wise kind of, you know, uh, paths would you recommend that they go and start off with or, or, uh, kind of, um, you know, how to start looking for jobs, um, how to get into the industry, and how to really uh, evolve and, and, and get their career accelerated. Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, some of those other resources like John Hammond and the Cyber Mentor, their content is is really good. Look for the, I would say, look for the free and low cost uh, mm -hmm. type of content. And also too, I would say, if you're wanting to be a pen tester and that appeals to you, do that, but I would encourage you to check out the different areas of cybersecurity because you may find something that you like better than that. And if you if it's something you really like, you're going to be passionate and you're going to be willing to put in more time and effort to learn. So I definitely explore the different options instead of just being set mm -hmm. on. If it's something you want to do, do it. But I would also encourage you to look at some of the other things. And if you go, as you mentioned earlier, like the B-Sides conferences, those are either free to very low cost and you can go see some of the different talks there and, and, you know, the, over the different disciplines and then maybe find an area mm -hmm. that you'd be more interested in. Absolutely. Very wise. Chloe, any, any thoughts as well? Yes. Read the first tribe of hackers book. I kid you not. That's going to give you a really good idea of like what kind <laughs> of things that are going to be good for you or things that you may have a similar background as one of the people in the book. Um, but also to check out, so cyber, we did some webinars that I recorded and posted on our website that do role dives of various different roles to get into. And I think that's really good to know of like what you need to know, what the everyday looks like for that role. I think that's the thing is like, or is like, come and join us. And then they're like, okay, I need to get certs, but then they don't know what <laughs> job works for them. So for me, I'm always thinking like, first think of your background. You know, are you one of those people that when you're playing chess, are you defensive or are you the mm. opposite? Are you one of those people that wants to learn how things work and then like, how do you break it? Then maybe red teaming might be good for you pen testing. If you're someone who is more of like, how do I protect this from someone who may try to break something, you might be a blue teamer. And then there's also purple team, which is when you're like, you know what, I kind of do both. So there's so many options out there, no matter what your background is, even if you are in marketing and you're trying to get into something new and want to get a technical role, 
just going to apply for a job in marketing and cybersecurity, get your foot in the door, learn everything you can about the industry, mm -hmm. and then start training to get that technical role. There's always a role in cybersecurity. And sometimes the fastest way to get there is first getting a role that's connected to the one you already have in a cybersecurity company and then moving over. So don't give up. Enjoy your research, experience things, talk to people in that enroll and learn if that's a one for you. And if you do something and it didn't work out, cool, you try something else. Life is an experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. This, I mean, this that's the important thing is that cybersecurity is not just one role. It's an entire, it's so many different roles. To your point that it could even be simply marketing um, that gets the entry point that gets you familiar with the verbiage and the terminology and the content um, to cryptography, which is more maths based or to pen testing, you know, and to your point, you made me laugh about the chess side, you know, because I, I myself am a very uh, aggressive attacker in chess. <laughs> I'm always, always going straight for the, for the checkmate, um, which is not always the best approach, but uh, <laughs> it's just my style. Uh, but to your point, yeah, absolutely. That it's important also to find what you, what you're passionate about and what you enjoy doing. That's really important is that because a lot of me, like myself, this is my hobby um, that I just happen to be doing as my job. Um, and for you, you know, anyone who's getting in the industry, I think, you know, also find, find your hobby, find what you enjoy doing and, and make a career out of it because that's where you start really getting passionate. But that's where you have fun. Um, that's where you enjoy it. And that's where, you know, you yourself can can make sure that you're you know, surrounding yourself with like, you know, minded people and also people who don't, you know, diversity is also important as well. You want to get people who think differently than you. So you actually learn from them as well. So I think it's really important to make sure that, you know, find something you really enjoy doing. Um, and, you know, if, as Chloe mentioned, um, if you get into one thing and you might find that, you know, it's not for you, it doesn't mean to say that you need to leave cybersecurity industry and find something else. You might find something else in the same industry that might be more enjoyable, that might be more aligned to what you want to be doing. I think that's what's really critical here. So absolutely, you know, it's been it's been fantastic having you both on this session. I think this is a really critical thing. I think this discussion is an important topic. Um, you know, for for anyone who's who's looking to get in the industry, um, there's lots of great knowledge here, lots of great information uh, about you know. Um, I think, Phil, you mentioned about there's lots of low cost options uh, to get in the industry. It doesn't need you don't need to go and get a certification. That's definitely not something it's not mandatory in the industry to get into the industry. You don't need a certification. You don't need years of experience. You just need to have an Internet connection, a computer or, you know, basically access to a community that's close to you, whether it being going to B-sides or whether it being other similar types of events. Uh, to really get uh, access to, to people who can sometimes point you in the right path. Um, so it's been fantastic having you both on the show. I think this is so vital. I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, that we can find a way to make sure that we get more people. And, and I think one of the critical things that um, both of you mentioned as well is you know, even those who have went on the criminal path in the past, that we have to make sure that there's actually an opportunity for them to add good to the industry going forward. I think that needs to be something that's critical. Many organizations, if there's one thing to take away, is make sure that we give people the opportunity, that we give them, you know, the opportunity to to use their skills um, and and contribute to society and make the world a safer place. So, Phil, it's been great having you on the show. Fantastic uh, meeting you uh, face to face. We've been communicating quite a lot on social media for a long time. Uh, it's so great to finally get to, to chat with you and, and hear your view. And Chloe, it's great to catch up with you again. So fantastic. Any final final words of wisdom? Last comments. Yeah, one thing I'd like to share is is to tell on your learning journey, be patient with yourself. Give yourself grace. It takes time to learn complex things. Don't give up. Just be persistent and, and be patient. Absolutely. Very wise words. And Chloe? You're going to feel at times that you don't know anything and that like you barely scratch the surface. And when you start thinking like that, that's actually a good sign. That means that you are aware of yourself, but also to note that there's so much information out there, always new things all the time. So just be kind to yourself because you're not going to be able to know everything. And so if you're dealing with imposter syndrome, just remember you're here right now. You've done successful things in your life. So why aren't you successful right now? Why are you thinking that way? And I guarantee you, it's probably because one, you feel there's a lack of representation, or it could also be the fact that there's so much information out there that you feel like you are not, you know, 
smart enough in that area. And I'm going to be honest with you, that's not the case. So be kind to yourself. You're a great person at the end of the day. Very wise. I think it's important, you know, is, is take time to reward yourself. Um, you know, take pause and, 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 you know, look at your achievements, look at what you've done so far and, and, and reward yourself with it. I think it's really important. I think uh, one of the uh, talks John Hammond gave recently, which I thought was impressive, you know, and you mentioned about imposter syndrome, is that you have a lot of knowledge to add that other people don't know. Um, and that's something that we, you know, that's the value that we have to add to the end. And it's always continuous learning on that side. So, so again, thanks very much for joining me in the episode today. Uh, for the audience, make sure, you know, we've had awesome guests with, uh, you know, Chloe back on uh, as my co-host and uh, Phil Wiley here, who's really an industry kind of pioneer and, and a huge person who adds a lot of knowledge uh, to the industry and community. So again, thank you for being on the show. Everyone tune in every two weeks. This is the 401 Access Tonight podcast with Joe, Chloe and uh, Phil today. Um, and uh, stay safe out there and I will see you on future episodes. So thank you and take care. All the best. Goodbye.